Hare Krishna Dev Madhav Prabhu, welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Wonderful to be with you Prabhu, as always, my obeisances. Because several devotees told me about how they liked uh, our podcast, especially on Western Outreach. Mm. Bhakti Vinod Maharaj is one of the prominent preachers in South India. Jai Patakama, my disciple, he is also interested in Western Outreach. So he told me in our discussion, in the discussion of two of us, a lot of points came out which he had never heard. He has a, mm. he has participated in seminars on Western Outreach, but it was so it's very insightful. So I, it, anytime I have a conversation with you, Prabhu, I feel like something fruitful is going to happen, at least for me. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad that something came out for other people too. That's true. So Prabhu, with Janmashtami coming up, I thought we could uh, talk about a more directly devotional subject. But maybe we will approach it from a secular perspective. So we could talk about the concept of God, specifically you know, wo- how the Krishna conception of God challenges and charms the contemporary mind. <laughs> You're always so clever with your phrasings, Prabhu. I love that. <laughs> yeah, so I, get some, I think that is the only rasa I get. I don't know if I get any <laughs> devotional rasa. But some intellectual rasa used in the service of devotion is all that I have in my life. Yeah, well, you have quite a lot of it. So if, if it's working, keep with it. Yeah. <laughs> Challenges so, and charms. It certainly does. Yeah. So I remember I read some book. Uh, I don't remember which book now. It said that they did a cross-section survey of you just go on the street and ask people what is the strangest thing a stranger has ever told you. <laughs> hmm? A stranger has suddenly approached you and told you. Uh, so it seems a significant number of people said it is the Hare Krishna's approaching us and telling us that a bluish black bo- youth is God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now I I know sometimes I'll talk about it in a lighter way. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. It's still the strangest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> That's true. So maybe we can start with your story. You know, what was your idea of God before and how was it challenged or fulfilled when you encountered Krishna? Mm. Um, I was one of those who was in a, an amalgamation of in distress and in search for shelter and in search for knowledge all at once when I, I met the devotees. And I had gone to something in my heart had told me go to Detroit. And I happened to be working with a door to door book selling company, um, going door to door selling educational textbooks for children. Mm. And I was distributing books, but not Prabhupada's books yet. And I was in uh, Highland Park, Chicago, where your, your Gurmaraj um, uh, was born, where he appeared there in the mm. suburbs of Chicago. And I left that place. Uh, somehow my heart said go to Detroit. And I went to Detroit. And I went there with this mood of trying to help the people. I wanted somehow to uplift them with these educational uh, product offerings and make my life something of service. I, I had that inclination at that point in my life. I was starting to see around me that everything is suffering. <laughs> Whatever I try to do for someone else, it just undoes a part of me and a part of them in the ultimate. And so let me try to contribute something. But what can I really contribute? So I went to Detroit where people were in apparently great need and left this place, Highland Park, Chicago, which as for your Gurmaraj, gave this very kind of disillusioned feeling because everything is very nice there. <laughs> everything is perfect, suburbs, nice, nice grass, nice plastic surgery faces. So in Detroit, those three weeks um, that I was there before I met the devotees, I was going door to door and I was asking people, what, what do you think caused your city to fall apart? Why are you in the condition you're in now? What would help you? And so many of them were saying that it was the, um, the churches, actually. They were blaming the churches who were, uh, yeah, who were promoting this. They called it Jesus, Jesus money. <laughs> they said that that's the kind of gospel of the church uh, in the big kind of um, what they call mega churches that had kind of taken over Detroit. These like stadiums, 10, 9, 7,000 people uh, in one church. Jesus, Jesus, money. If you worship Jesus and give us some money, then he'll give you some money back. And this kind of um, very shallow presentation of spiritual culture. And so I was here, there I was thinking about that as I was going door to door in Detroit. And at the same time, I was looking into offering this educational material. 
and I was more and more realizing that the whole track of a good education and success in the Western culture was ultimately just to bring those children in Detroit to the same place that those children in Highland Park already were. And I'd already concluded and seen for myself and experienced also that those children in Highland Park weren't really any happier than the children in Detroit, that material success didn't bring you much. It just, in, in fact, it sometimes brings more anxiety because now you have nowhere to go. You've already achieved everything there is to get, but you're still not satisfied. So there's this hollow, empty, hopeless feeling. And so in this very like melancholy situation, I knocked on the door of the temple president of the, the Detroit temple. And instead of buying one of my books, uh, his name is Braj Kumar now. Okay. Uh, one of your God brothers. Uh, at the time, his name was Bharat. And there's a little, I actually met his wife first and then she had me come back. So she was the very first devotee I ever met. And then she had me come back and speak to her husband. And instead of buying one of my books, I bought one of his books. <laughs> I, took, I took one of Prabhupada's books home. He, he gave it to me as a gift, actually. We had a great conversation. And in that book, I was, it was Science of Self-Realization, which personally, I feel if you're going to give a book to a new person, and that new person is of an intellectual, you know, kind of Western mindset, whether they're from India or America, um, the best book to give someone is The Science of Self-Realization. It's a very powerful thoughtful, methodical presentation of Krishna consciousness. And you learn who Prabhupada is as a person because many of the presentations that are conversations. And so in reading those conversations of Prabhupada, I really, I saw somebody who was willing to answer the questions that other people were angry for me even asking. The big questions about life and, and why are we here and why is there so much suffering and how can there be a, a God and at the same time suffering exists and, and can we do anything about it? Srila Prabhupada's answers were so lucid and clear. And it was such a relief because growing up, I'd, I'd come in from a, a kind of, you could say, a Christian background in the, the South of America, where it's a very narrow, kind of classic, um, evangelical, Protestant presentation of Christianity, mm. where it's like, you're in our boat or you're drowning, you're going to hell, you're done. You either agree with our team and everything we say, or you're no one and you have no spiritual value. And so that very distasteful uh, presentation was such a so contrasted by Prabhupada's broad mindedness and encouragement and uh, clear appreciation for Christianity and Judaism and Islam, anything that brought you to real love of God. So that was the most refreshing thing for me when I first met the devotees was this idea that spiritual value is universal and it can be cultivated in any tradition. And still it does bring you to recognition of an objective truth. So your subjective experience can have value in helping you recognize the objective truth. That felt really right when Prabhupada, you know, in, in Prabhupada's presentation. Beautiful. By subjective experience, you mean uh, the experience of, say, different religious traditions or religious seekers in their particular paths. Yes. And yet God is an objective reality ultimately. Yes, and even cultural, social experiences. As, as I mentioned, I left the very, you know, very white, very well-to-do suburb, and I went to this very poor, very black, ethnic, uh, inner city situation. And in both places, I saw how their experiences could inform them of this truth that Srila Prabhupada was describing. Mm. So you don't, you don't have to sit, preference anybody, which is a value in you know, Western ethics is like egalitarianism and everybody's experience matters and my truth and your truth. These are all phrases today that people use to bring out this point, which is that your subjective experience has value in indicating the objective truth. That's, that's very striking because at one level, when we talk about Krishna consciousness, there is a certain level of specificity, but that is the beauty that we have specificity without narrow mindedness. Mm. And uh, in some ways, people feel that in order to be, at least I have read this in some books, which, sub, which say historically in India, they favor monism as a unifying force. They said India mm -hmm. as a nationalist force could be united by monism. Mm -hmm. said because as soon as you have something specific, some people identify with the specific and some don't. And that makes it sectarian. Mm -hmm. But if we have the non-specific or generic absolute truth, the impersonal absolute truth, then there won't be any sectarianism associated with that. 
Mm. So was the specificity of Krishna, of the Krishna conception, ever a challenge for you? It's funny that when I, looking back, I realized my first few months spending time with the devotees, and I was, at that point, I was going to the morning program. Uh, I guess I met the devotees in July and went to the Rath Yatra. Actually, the, my first, my second Sunday feast, we were, it was Snan Yatra. So I was bathing the deities and I, you know, pouring the milk and honey over these, you know, wood carvings. <laughs> it was a very surreal experience, but I just, I kind of went with it. I didn't question it. But a few months later, uh, during Kartik, when we were every day uh, during the morning program singing this song to baby Krishna and Mother Yashoda and, and spending so much time focusing on the deities, I suddenly realized that these crazy people actually think this little blue boy is God. <laughs> <laughs> it suddenly dawned on me like they don't think this is a metaphor. They don't think this is some kind of like analogy or, you know, some kind of fable that was created to make up, you know, impart morals like they think this little kid is God, and I might too. <laughs> it's the, the, <laughs> feeling, the feeling of, of recognizing my own budding faith was so striking because it's, and it, it speaks to, you know, Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his Ch Chaitanya Shikshamrita, he talks about how certain anartas are just removed by Krishna's mercy. Anartas towards voidism and impersonalism and, and the idea, you know, atheistic conceptions that God is not a person most of those anartas are actually addressed by Krishna, just kind of by his mercy. Uh, Bhaktivinoda talked about mm. the killing of the demons and the different anartas they represent in Vrindavan. And so I, I realized, like it, it dawned on me, I might actually believe also that this little blue boy is the supreme person. And it, it was during that first uh, experience of Kartik Mas and, and the worship involved and the mercy that comes and seeing the other devotees, and particularly there was this one little young boy, Naratam, and Naratam was only three years old at the time. And he would come in each morning with his parents. He would himself pay obeisances to Prabhupada. He wouldn't, you know, mom and dad usually force the kids head down and, you know, drag them over to the altar and take them by each one of the deities and try to get them to pay obeisances. But this little boy on his own would joyfully pay obeisances to Prabhupada, be the very first person waiting for the deity curtain to open. When the deity curtains open, his hands fly up in the air, and then he lays down with, with all sincerity in front of each one of the altars and witnessing that a young three-year-old boy, much the same age as boy Krishna, who we were reading and singing about every day, could have so much natural faith and affection for these apparent you know, statues and, and songs from a religious tradition that he, you know, how can he understand as a three-year-old boy what's really going on? It struck me seeing that experience a three-year-old was having I said, this must be real. What, what I'm experiencing must also be possible if this three-year-old can be having the same. You know, that's fascinating. Now, I, if I think back at my life, you mentioned three-year-old, I don't really remember my first remembrance of Krishna. In mm -hmm. the sense that we grew up in a culture where Krishna was a familiar part of the religious iconography. The mm -hmm. place where I lived, was just behind my house till my third third standard. I was probably six, seven years old or eight years old. Uh, the place behind there, we had a Ram temple. Uh -huh. And okay. we had a Ram image at our home. So I was more centered on Ram. And then I moved to Nasik, where I lived for most of my youth. And that is also a place sacred for Lord Ram. Okay. So in that sense, I connected with more Ram as an image of divinity. Hmm. And then in India, there were the there was an attempt to televise the epics. So the Ramayana was immensely popular, hmm. and after that, the Mahabharata was televised. <clears throat> and that was, I think, probably my first direct impression of Krishna. Of course, I had read and I had heard, and in fact, in my childhood, I had recited the Bhagavad Gita verses, but I didn't really connect Bhagavad Gita with Krishna so directly. Hmm. So in, and was the presentation in those in those um, serials, I think they're called, right? Was was the presentation in that Mahabharat that Krishna is the supreme person or was he like another character? How did he well, occur to it you? Did, it did talk about Krishna is God. It did not necessarily, everything was in agreement with the philosophy. But <laughs> it was definitely, Krishna's divinity was not denied. Huh, See, okay. I think the first presentations on both the Ramayana and the Mahabharata were quite faithful to the tradition. Mm. 
and they were also done by people at least the directors were somewhat pious if not devoted when subsequent because it the original one is already done there have been many many subsequently done so then they tried various things they tried to have more special effects they tried to have more plot twists and they tried to bring in more uh, more narratives that challenge the mainstream narrative that's how they mm. put it mm. so of course they they also had to decide how much boundaries to stretch without uh, without alienating the readers yeah right intrigue the intrigue the viewers but not alienate them mm. so but the first was quite good so there i got the impression of krishna as a very very shrewd person <laughs> so krishna was that but that is mahabharat in the mahabharat krishna childhood past times are not talked about much mm. but it is more of how he expertly guides the pandavas yeah. and how he is very very now shrewd Stay. can have a both a negative and a positive connotation for sure and he's both comes well, there, both came in that mm. and then like you said uh in my journey toward krishna consciousness also it was not so much the krishna conception as the krishna philosophy that attracted mm. first mm. that you know, okay there is a, some higher meaning to life even life's material success doesn't bring fulfillment there has to be something higher and that that highest reality is krishna it was more of a like a, okay this is a whole package and this package this thing is there yes so, yes <laughs> and although the whole we call it krishna consciousness and krishna is the center but really when we take to krishna consciousness even as a indian when i took to krishna consciousness there is so much going on within that that mm. the focus on krishna itself or the you could say the unusualness of the conception of krishna as god mm. that doesn't register unless somebody tells it or some incident happens yes so i grew up in a christian i grew up in a hindu brahmin family and i went to a christian convent school mm. and both gave some we could say nominal uh nominal not not even devotion nominal theological conception of god mm. uh, so then i remember i think it is again damodar ashtakam i had gone to rindavan yatra and for me physically yatras are quite an austerity mm -hmm. and i was completely irritated and exhausted i yatras are on, for many devotees yatras are are a great delight mm -hmm. for me physical austerity is demanding for me being around people is demanding and yatra means both of them come together yeah, a lot of both mostly only those things <laughs> yeah so i was i was completely frustrated i was kind of exhausted and frustrated and then mm -hmm. we went to the uh, temple the radharaman uh, the our um, krishna balram temple mm -hmm. and there my guru maharaj radhanath maharaj started singing the damodar ashtakam and that was such a stunning experience mm -hmm. it was it was uh i i could say that i experienced something which i had never experienced till then mm -hmm. and then similarly i think the second time when i experienced you could say krishna or something like that was during my first recitation of the gopi gita i think it was bhakti charu maharaj who was reciting it ah uh. and these two are even now for me probably the things that give the closest experience of krishna wow so for me mostly it has been through sound that is not so much to go through places even mm -hmm. if i go to places even if i go in front of deities it is not the place of the deity that gives me an experience of krishna it is i need to go there and recite some verses or articulate some prayers mm. so it is more a we could say a sonic connection with the divine rather than a visual connection shabda brahman shabda brahman okay yeah <laughs> so where how do you experience krishna the most uh i appreciate that question i would i would agree sound um is so power and particularly the shrimad bhagavatam if i look at my own if i'm in distress if i'm feeling melancholy uncertain disconnected uh uninspired all those things at the end of the day what i want to do is sit and read bhagavatam then and and that will reassure me and and give me that um sense of satisfaction and also safety 
which is, you know, we, when, whenever we have those negative emotions and feelings and it's in the, and it's an indication that we don't have a, a positive enough sense of self, right? Where our own identity feels uncertain because of this material energy, our existence is in the atmosphere of non-existence as Prabhupada says. Yeah. So when I read that, those verses from the Bhagavatam, I, I just, I'm reminded that it's real. I'm real. You're real. We're all real. <laughs> it's going to work out. <laughs> just stick, stick close and it will happen. And then also Harinam, uh, if I can, I can, in my devotional life, I can trace <clears throat> all the blessings and I've received many, all the blessings that I've received from the devotees in my personal life, spiritually, materially, what have you, it's all come through my spiritual master and Harinam, those two, my, my, to whatever degree I've been able to focus on those two things, uh, those two people, then I've been able to receive Krishna consciousness and being out and, and chanting the holy name for the benefit of others, Jiva Doya, uh, Krishna Nam Sarva Dharma Sar. To the degree I've been able to do that sincerely, I've felt the, you know, the blessing come through. So also sound vibration. It's beautiful. Mm. So now moving on to you know, our topic was how challenges and charms, Krishna yeah. conception. So we took our journey. They, when you are introducing not just Krishna consciousness to new people, but mm. the idea of Krishna as God. Mm. Have you experienced any apprehension in doing so at any time with new oh, people? Yeah. And how have, you how have you dealt with that? Sure. Yeah, mountains of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> mountains of it. Uh, one, one idea that I, I'm coming to more and more today um, that I'll, I'll share now that I, I could, there's an idea in sales, as I mentioned, I used to sell books door to door. So there's this idea in sales that the first person to the objection wins. Say I'm selling large boats, I'm selling yachts. So the objection to a yacht is that, besides I may not live on water, <laughs> is the price, right? It's very expensive. Everyone wants a big boat, but who can afford it? So if I'm selling a yacht, then the first thing I'm going to do is address price. Somebody walks in my shop, I'm going to say, you know, I can tell you're a man who doesn't care about money. You're a man who values the finer things in life and whatever it costs you to live the best life you can, that's the choice you're going to make. I, I might say something like that. That's clever. Okay. Get it on the table, right? First one wins. Whereas if I, I go my whole presentation and then he says, well, it's all very nice, but you know, I think it's a little pricey. Then I'm in the... Um, defensive position now rather than on the offensive having already brought out this this idea of the price as an obvious barrier to the person buying thing so what was the statement you made in the starting the uh, one the who first, addresses the first objection yeah the first person to the objection wins meaning there's a there's a series of there's a couple natural reasons the person wouldn't want to make a choice so, and and when we're talking about buying a product it's the most simplistic way of uh framing the analogy yeah okay. right I, so the objection might be i don't live near water uh, around buying a boat it's too expensive it's too much maintenance right there's a few things yeah, just a minute the, i understood that point but the first person to the objection the objection the first, yeah, the first person, person addresses the objection that's is right, it somebody brings person. up the objection or somebody addresses the objection yeah the first person to bring it up okay if you wait for the customer to bring it up then you're on the defensive <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you could say it in a class. You know, sometimes before, before in the class itself, is some, our question and question is addressed right in the beginning. No, yes. I want to hear this. But otherwise, <laughs> if you have a question that goes on, then that doesn't that really you could say distracts us from focusing on the class. Very much so. Right. Somebody says something and we don't. It doesn't sit well with us. Then the whole rest of the time they're speaking, we're only thinking about that thing that doesn't sit well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. This is how it is in Krishna consciousness: is that <clears throat> we don't need people to believe in Krishna, and this is a, a misconception in the presentation of our philosophy. We need people to experience Krishna. I didn't believe in Krishna. I experienced him. I experienced the power of his name, the power of his prasadam, the power of his association with his devotees that the prayers of Damodar Astakam, seeing that little boy, that was, those were all experiences. I didn't have any belief, any kind of a priori need to associate with this culture. It was something direct and felt. And so we have to accept that people are naturally going to have intellectual apprehensions about a blue boy who plays a flute being the supreme person. 
Mm. And if we can allow those, if we can just be okay with that and, and let the experience of Krishna also be there for them, then automatically, just as it did for us, if we're a little humble and honest, we can admit it wasn't our intellect that brought us to accepting Krishna as God. It was the experiences of, of him as who he is because of the mercy of the devotees that now here we are today having this conversation. So being, uh, actually having that conversation with the person and allowing them to express their doubts that, you know, this seems, you know, it seems a little far fetched and I, you know, I like this process, but the Bhagavatam is a lot. And these, some of these stories just seem like they're, they're more stories rather than history. If you can sit and, and just accept a person saying that without the need to kind of push back, and at the same time say, well, what do you think about chanting? What do you think about the prasadam? Have you noticed any positive changes in your life as you've started to associate more with the devotees and just kind of fan that spark? It will naturally burn away all the ap apprehensions eventually. Beautiful. So you, when we are using the word believe, it is more in the sense of we are addressing the rational aspect. And can I rationally accept it or not accept it? So whereas, yeah. whereas the strength of bhakti, of course, we can make a rational case for bhakti, but the strength of bhakti is not so much its rationality as its experientiality, if there's a word like that. Yes. So, yes. so then that means, even if there's no belief in Krishna, at least somehow we need to create enough credibility for people to at least open themselves to the experience of Krishna. Exactly. Exactly. Bhagavat Tattva Vigyana Mukta Sangasya Jayate, the famous verses of the Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada gives first canto chapter two. He says, this is the process of Krishna consciousness. And that's the feature verse. When you have Bhagavat Tattva Vigyana, that, that scientific experience, Indian, American, young, old, rich, poor, you have that scientific connection, experiential then after that mukta comes, that liberation from all the anxiety of material energy. When we're giving people the explanation of Krishna consciousness, it's not always an experience. It's, it's a Wikipedia page. It's a, you know, a kind of uh, academic, um, you know, reading a, a list of religious bullet points. It's not necessarily the experience, which that, the actual thing that they need. And so in our own Krishna conscious communities, I've noticed too much emphasis on the philosophy at the loss of just experiencing Krishna. And if you, the proof of this for me is the Christians who make so many more members every year, their philosophy is not anything compared to ours. <laughs> their, their, their philosophy has so many clear holes and, and you know, missteps and incongruities. Any intellectual person, even a Christian one admits that. And yet when they think and talk about what Jesus did for them, they call it testimony. They testify what, what has happened now that Jesus has come into my life. That's where the power is in the Christian community, that I had all these problems and all these anxieties and all these fears. And now I've, I've invited Jesus into my life and all those emotions have transformed into something sublime. That's, it, that's exactly what we want for Krishna consciousness is the devotees to personally testify to their experience. And sometimes that gets obfuscated because of this need to speak to this like objective supreme philosophy, which in itself is just a kind of um, container for the experience of a relationship with Krishna. Fascinating, you put it this way. I'm thinking of Shila Prabhupada's early days, his classes where he talked about how you're not the body or the soul, but mm -hmm. it was more the Kirtans and his personal kindness totally. and his, his sweet dealings with the devotees. Yes. That's what, uh, that's what attracted people. Yes. So, so we could also put it this way that we need rationality to, as I said earlier, to clear the way for people to experience Krishna. But sometimes our emphasis on rationality might be so forceful that yes. we may, we may, we may put down people's emotional shutters because we may offend something which they believe previously and then mm. they, they can't experience Krishna. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting. So now another point which I thought of when you were speaking is that uh, 
I have heard many times in classes, and I have also talked about in my classes how the conception of this bluish black cowherd boy as God is so yeah. radical. Yes. But I have talked with so many devotees about how they came to Krishna consciousness, and not one of them has mentioned the Krishna conception of God as a factor in their coming to Krishna, either obstructing <laughs> them or bringing them. <laughs> it is not. I mean, that particular conception of Krishna has not played a major role. Mm. Of course, I won't say it has not played a role, but it is not so major a role that um, it either factored a positively or negatively. Yeah. So, even as, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I visited a museum uh, a week ago, and I was thinking about this. When you see a painting, your first idea isn't who made this painting? Your first idea is, do I like this painting? First, you're examining the work and you're looking at, you know, its layout and is there something being expressed here? And, and does it resonate with me? It's all, it's all centered on you. And then if you appreciate it or if it strikes you in some way, then you ask the question, okay, who painted this? And if you're very inspired, you come to want to know about that painter. What, what was the period they were painting in? What was the inspiration for this particular work? Uh, where, where does that sit in their overall uh, canon of, of uh, artistic um, output? So that, that interest in the person naturally comes later. First, you want to experience that, what that person has made and created and decide, is it even worth getting to know this guy? <laughs> and it, it's very, it seems very similar to what you're pointing out, which is that we're all attracted to things around Krishna first before we then naturally eventually want to know who's, the person that's created all of these interesting things. That's an interesting point. You are equating Krishna with the artist or the painter. And the whole experience of Krishna consciousness as the, like the painting. The painting. That's interesting. So, yeah. So, it's interesting again that, so do I like it is a more important question than then does this make right. sense? Of course, yeah, exactly. But does this make sense? So, you know, exactly. in the Vedanta Sutra also, it is said that Brahmacharya in his commentary uses, says that we can use rationality to, to some extent point to the existence of God. <clears throat> Although it can go both ways. But he says, to know about God's existence, reason can work. But to know about God's personality, mm. not reason. He says it, it requires revelation. Mm. And revelation doesn't just refer, now I'm thinking about it aloud, that revelation doesn't just refer to some, some books that are considered revelations, but yeah. revelation also has to be like an experience that is revealed in our heart yes. by which we come to know. So the, the books that are revelations can be aids for us, can be, are, are, you could say almost in, indispensable aids for yeah. us to have the, have the revelation in our own hearts in the form of experience. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Making me, <clears throat> do you remember this? You, we've all heard it, this famous statement from Nietzsche, a Western philosopher. He said, God is dead. And yeah. this is, it, it's, a, it's a statement which is often almost always quoted out of context. Nietzsche was not declaring that God is actually dead. What Nietzsche was pointing to is the very shallow kind of relationship that Western culture had with theology and, and Krishna. It was a very explanatory um, relationship, transactional, where we needed God to explain the natural phenomena we saw around us that we, we couldn't um, point out the, the mechanistic process of. So how is the rain falling from the sky, being evaporated back into clouds and then falling again? How is the sun rising and setting and the moon changing phases? Because we didn't know how to explain those things from a Western side centuries ago. We needed some kind of divine being to arrange it all. But in the rest of that essay, Nietzsche says, what did we do when we untethered the earth from its sun? Describing when we learned how the, you know, the planets are situated and the sun is, et cetera, when we learned more of the details of our world around us, then suddenly our relationship with God was no longer necessary because we didn't actually have a relationship. <laughs> it was just a set of kind of rationalities and some kind of transactional um, uh, 
uh, exchanges that we needed from him, but the actual connection with him as a person was missing. So we murdered God once we, we removed our need for uh, our um, description of him. And that's what Nietzsche is pointing to in that essay, is the need for a deeper relationship with Krishna than just one on a surface of explaining the material world around you and how you can make yourself happy and comfortable in it. That's interesting, the way you're putting this. From, I, I haven't read all of Nietzsche. I mean, I don't think anybody can. He's quite a dense to... Dense no to, need. <laughs> but from what I read, that particular section, uh, what I thought was that he felt that uh, because of the advent of science, Mm-hmm. The, the concept of God was no longer rationally tenable. Mm. And so in his conception that, that, that well, did God exist? He, he was in some many, we could say an atheist. So for him, it was not that God ever existed, but the viability of the conception of God itself has become unacceptable now. That mm. God was no longer a rationally viable conception. Yeah, I would, I would walk it back just one level and go to, as Stephen Hawking said, God is not necessary. Yeah. Stephen Hawking, we don't need God to explain the universe, which is what Nietzsche is pointing to, is that we no longer need God to explain what's happening around us. It's, he could be there, but in order for us to know that he's there, we'll need to develop some other purpose for the relationship. Because the original impetus, which was to explain the world around us, is now no longer there because we have this mechanistic science to explain that relationship. Yes, true. You know, this is uh, maybe a different subject and we won't go too much into it. We could talk about it later. But this is one thing that in the history of uh, Europe, as you mentioned, that uh, since the time of the science, sci- maybe Renaissance and thereafter, there was a shift significantly from revelational theology to rational theology mm-hmm. that you know that god is someone who's revealed to us or god is rationally inferred and the more god became a rational inference mm-hmm. then if you can come up with a rational way to establish god's existence we can come up with a rational way to counter his existence also exactly so now from our tradition's perspective there is the concept that om purnam adha purnam idam that mm. the world is com- that the divine is com- that the super- ultimate reality is complete and the world is also complete yeah in that sense uh, god is not needed to explain the world hmm? exactly but it doesn't mean that god is not there you know it is said mm. that the perfect management is that where everything is managed and no manager is visible <laughs> 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 so in Krishna's that sense, done. Krishna's done. Krishna has done that. Yes. So, so maybe that because I don't see much of a rational theology as being a issue in India. Mm. In India also, even now, although there are some critiques of religions and there are rationalist societies, but more often than criticizing the existence of God, they criticize many of the superstitions that go yeah. on in the name of religion and the target is more that. Yes. So, so have you experienced uh, even atheism as an intellectual conception among people obstructing them from experiencing Krishna? Of course, that's that's why I was bringing out this point. I think it's very, um, it's very, I'm glad we're having this line of discussion because it's so much centered around what we're trying to do in the West to share Krishna and why it's not working very well is because the the needs that we're speaking to in people's lives, they don't need Krishna for that. They don't need Krishna to explain the world around them. They need to, they need Krishna to explain the turmoil inside their heart. They're emotionally distraught people totally um, confused and scared about their own identity. Everything around them in the world is is explained, but inside they can't understand how to relate to it in a healthy way. And that's what people are suffering and a loss of. They can, they can learn about who got elected in, in parliamentary um, uh, elections in Turkey right now, if they wanted to, sitting in their bedroom in Ohio. 
the world is flooded with information uh, about the existence and materials uh, external, but it's the internal situation that people are lost and confused and scared about. And so when we put so much emphasis on the philosophy of Krishna consciousness and the kind of explaining the universe, but we don't focus on the relational aspect and Krishna, the personality, then we disenfranchise the Western population because that's where they really need him. And that's where they'll have an experience that the, the scientific, you know, rational uh, atmosphere around them can't account for and can't offer. That's beautiful. So, you know, it's like there has to be, I read the book on writing that solutions are useless unless they are attached to an identifiable problem. Mm. So mm. you might give the best solution. I might have the most precious medicine, but yeah. if you don't have the de disease that is going to cure that medicine, that medicine is of no value to you. Or if I don't know that I have the disease. <laughs> yeah. Or I don't know also that this medicine will work for that disease. That's right. All of those things prevent the solution from being very attractive. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so certainly mental health crisis is a far bigger crisis. I read an article in New York Times long ago which said that you know, how mainstream Christian or evangelical Christianity has rebranded God. Mm. Not God as the cosmic physician, cosmic uh, provider. Like, oh, Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, give us our daily bread. But God as the cosmic therapist. Yes. Exactly. Because yeah. people are going to get their daily bread from Amazon. And they're going to get their entertainment from Netflix. And they don't have to talk to a single other person to, to exist. But that existence is so shallow and so unfulfilling and so, so terrifying, actually, that when we help them see that real life is about relationships, and that's what's special about Krishna, is that he doesn't want to be God either. He lets somebody else take care of all the administration. He himself, in his village in Vrindavan, is just concerned with loving, intimate exchanges. And that's what you're missing and that's what you want. When that's what we present, then we, we have a ground to stand on. We have, we have an exclusive product to bring to the marketplace. But from any other place, the rest of the world has something to offer that's easier to get without all the attachments and, and you could say um, inconveniences of the Krishna conscious culture. That's beautiful. You know, I, I took, uh, whenever I speak in the West, mm. um, I see if I travel for three more months and I give probably a class a day, so I might give probably a hundred classes out of there, maybe 20 will be to Western audiences. But mm. most of them are on very basic topics like psychological topics, yeah. mindfulness and stuff like that. Mm. So it is only twice that I took a, I mean, I was a, like a tour guide for about 25, 30 Western people who went mm. to Vrindavan and Vrindavan and Rishikesh and Govardhan Ikobali and other places. And mm. we, so we were talking. So that was the first time I actually got to speak about Krishna directly ah. to Western people. Mm. And what was the response? And you know, I, I didn't, I was a little, it seems I was more apprehensive than they were skeptical. That's right. So, <laughs> Right. And it seemed, of course, they were not really people who were devotees or not many of them became devotees, but they were mm. quite open to explore. Totally. And so I was, I was talking more about the Krishna conception of God. Of course, we are going to temples and I was hesitating to tell stories because, you know, uh -huh. the, how, how do I tell the story of say Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill and what will they think about it rationally? Mm. But after that, we brought them to Mumbai and there... Radhanath Maharaj has this once a year, the Pushabhishek, the flower festival. Hmm. And in that he gives classes and he speaks quite directly about Krishna. But I found that there was no, the, the surrounding atmosphere was so sweet that you know, people, everybody's coming together and making, making, taking out flower petals and then showering the Lord and showering each other and the music was soothing and people were warm and welcoming. That it just went along with the experience. And yes. in fact, the way he tells the Leela, tells the pastimes of Krishna in such a way that you know, it just charms the heart. Mm. So now that you're talking about the, if the experience of Krishna is what is important, then 
in some ways we have a reservoir of past times of krishna which say other religious traditions don't have that kind of activities of god per se isn't it exactly exactly so have you ta- have you talked about krishna's past times with new people or how has you your experience yes. um and t- krishna and also lord chaitanya there's the i i have a little essay and and a one day it could be turned into a book um the the five features of lord chaitanya uh that make him the ideal avatar for this age cuz he loves to dance everyone loves to dance he loves to sing everyone loves to sing he he came and shattered all social boundaries right he didn't care muslim man woman rich poor he shattered all castes and social strata and offered the highest thing to everyone who was ready to step up to it lord chaitanya and his pastimes and dealings with the aristocracy his dealings with the the low born his dealings with people from other castes are so ideal and in line with modern values that's what's it's so beautiful lord chaitanya is the avatar of the age and it's so clear if we just take a moment to see that so along with krishna uh, promoting lord chaitanya's pastimes mahaprabhu is in, in fact you know the kali yuga avatar so promote promoting and sharing his leela i found to be very powerful um one experience that i had was at a yoga st- <laughs> it was at a yoga studio um and i it was a kirtan program and the devotees who had organized the kirtan program invited me to speak and i just didn't want to talk about mindfulness anymore i didn't want to you know i know these guys already hear that stuff from other people and i know that i i don't want them to think that that's what we're about because we're not we're not about mindfulness and and peace and tranquility for its own sake those things come as a symptom of the degree to which we're focusing on krishna so i wanted to to offer them that focus on krishna and somehow or other i just decided to tell the past time of radha raman appearing for gopal bhatta and really? and they were yeah and they were enthralled <laughs> they loved it after and then i i told the past time of shila prabhupada and and how um there was a, a an anecdote which maybe some devotees are familiar with um but it's kind of one of those uh, less popular anecdotes shila prabhupada wound up coming to the US and landing stepping foot on uh US sh- soil the eve of an imminent russian nuclear attack there was going to be a nuclear attack on the US from russian submarines in the atlantic that were stationed there and one devotee's grandfather was on one such submarine and when his grandson was reading lilamrita to him decades later he sat up in, in his chair when he heard the date that prabhupada had landed on US soil because that date was forever etched in his memory as the day he was supposed to bomb the US and he didn't. So I shared that story and I shared the appearance of Radha Raman and afterwards every one of those 20 or so people in that yoga studio came and said I so much loved that story you shared. It so touched my heart. It's really pow- you know all kinds of glorifications of the glories of Krishna and Prabhupada. because that's the nectar they're anxious for and that's what no one else can give and we have and yet we often you know kind of throw ourselves in with the the shallower end of the pool at, in the name of accessibility and relatability missing out though on the the actual thing we have to offer which is exclusive and would bring them to krishna i'm amazed to hear this So how did you <laughs> what was the philosophical point you were making through that story of Gopal Bhatta I was Swami Radha Raman the power of prayer how prayer is the the purpose of the the power of prayer is to help us transcend the mundane reality right that here's a rock and and that rock is a rock forever except when it's not because prayer intervenes that intervention of the divine in our life and if we if we want that and if we're ready to accept the transformation that may happen to us and others because of it which we're actually scared of for all those and that's where the mindfulness comes in as a as a back end is that you're scared you don't want your life to change actually and you're clinging to your uh tr- your traumas and your excuses for your very mundane humdrum unimpressive life because that's all you know <laughs> so when you're praying you're actually praying for the strength to exist in that natural atmosphere you were meant to always be in which is one of love but you don't really want love 
So you need to turn to the person who's the source of love, and that's, that's Krishna. And so I, I framed all of that within this pastime, and, and very softly, not, not that you have to accept the purport, just hear the story for its own sake, hear the Leela, and it's, it's sweet, you know, you don't need to be explained the nature of the sugar structure in a mango, either this is fructose and this is sucralose and there's so much proportions of each, you just bite the mango and you know that this is sweet and juicy and I want another bite. Um, so again, not needing to couch it so much in philosophy, just let the Leela stand on its own strength and let your own example be the evidence of the power of living within this culture. And eventually people become attracted automatically. I re- the, just to speak to the power of Harinam, we were doing Harinam, uh, not daily, but maybe four times a week on campus at University of Michigan. And as you know, you've been here in Michigan winters, you've braved them. You're one of the few traveling preachers <laughs> who bothers to come to us when it's snowing outside. God bless you. <laughs> so we were doing Harinam through the winter at the University of Michigan, and we would be outside three or four days a week. And one girl who's, who used to, she was part of the Atheist Club. And I would attend this, they call them the Secular Student uh, Alliance. And so I would go to those meetings um, regularly and just you know, throw a wrench in their uh, schemes and plans. <laughs> That's a, a, another point. But anyway, April, when things started to open up, spring started to come, the sun is out and the birds are chirping and there's some buds on the trees. This young girl came up to us and I recognized her from the Atheist Club. And she said, you know, my friends and I have noticed you guys through the winter. And we don't believe in what you're doing, but we can tell there's something different about it. <laughs> it was amazing. You know, she's like, she didn't want to align herself completely with, you know, like throw her support in full on. But she was saying that there's, we can tell there's something different about what you're doing as compared to, you know, the Christian guys who only come to yell at us when it's nice and sunny out. We can tell there's something different about what you're doing because of how you did it, even when it was cold and uncomfortable. Still, you were out here. Still, you were with us. Still, you were, you know, your, your experience of that sound vibration was the same, whether it's nice or it's not nice. We can so tell there's saying, something different. Sorry. Are you saying you would go out for Harinam in winter or you would just go for their yeah. program? We would, we would go out for Harinam in wintertime. And in oh. noticing that and noticing the consistency and, and the mood of the devotees, whether it's sunny out and 70 degrees and lots of students, or whether it's drab and dreary and chilly and not many people to chant to, she noticed that our, our experience was the same in the chanting. And so she came to express that to us. She, she came and she said, we, we can tell there's something different about what you guys are doing. My God. So I could have explained to her until I was blue in the face like Krishna about the glory of the holy name and Sankirtan and you know, Lord Chaitanya said and Prabhupada did. But until I'm actually doing it myself, experiencing it, and, and that's my demonstrate. My preaching is my prachar, my activity. And so that's my preaching. Then people are going to reject it, it because of it, it's the explanation and the experience don't line up. This is my favorite definition of purity is when the explanation and the experience match. You say Krishna's name and you feel Krishna's presence. That's purity. The explanation and the experience are the same. So in our own humble way, we have to see how we can live with integrity to the experience of Krishna we're having personally and express it to others in a way that they can connect with that. They can share it. Don't, don't speak above our pay grade, but also don't degrade ourselves. Actually bring Krishna to the degree that we have him in our heart and other people will be able to access him. That's how the, the mercy works, that the devotee can give Krishna. That's beautiful. And I was hearing your explanation of the Gopal Vatta past time. So it, I was thinking almost every story in our canon, we could actually contextualize in universal terms or accessible terms. Totally. And then if there is an appropriate context, no matter how far out the specifics of the theory of the story may be, they don't matter that much. Exactly. Exactly. And this is, there's one, I, Prabhu, maybe you, you'd be a great devotee to take this on, or maybe we could do something like this together. But I've thought for a long time about helping people, uh, devotees, de-jargon their presentations. 
how to recognize what words can be substituted so that a Western, you know, minded person can hear the same pastime from the same Bhagavatam uh, Leela and not need to hear about demigods and, and yugas and, um, you know, other terms, which just every time they hear a term they don't know, it's another little barrier. So there's words, there's natural substitutes for all these ideas that then make the story flow in an easy way that lets them actually hear what's happening and, and the purport rather than the details which distract and put up barriers. That would be a wonderful that's, project. That's something we could educate the devotees on. Yeah, definitely. I like the word also, D jargon. Good yeah. word, yeah. That's true. Iskanese. <laughs> we have this. We have our own language of Iskanese, and we expect yeah. others to speak it or accept it. And if they don't, then they're demons and blah blah blah. And we would do ourselves and others a great service by, yeah, taking the jargon out of it. So no one really questioned the idea of the stone turning into a DT or anything like that. That was not no. an objection from them at all. No. I mean, I, and I, I can speak with testimony. This is, again, it's important. I've seen Radha Raman. <laughs> I've been in front of him. I've felt his presence. He's real in, in my heart. And so when I'm speaking about him, he's not a theory. He's a person. For me, he's a person. So then when I'm, it's like, if, if I'm talking about my mom, nobody's going to come back at me and say, I don't believe in your mom. My mom's real. Ever be, I'm, who would ever dare to say that my mom's not real? So when we speak about Krishna, we, we again tend to speak about him, even though we ourselves have an experience of him as a person, we speak about him as an abstracted concept, rather than speaking about him as a person that we have a relationship with. So the more we can do that, the less people feel comfortable challenging us because they see well, something's going on for this guy. I don't know if it would go on for me, but it's going on for him or her. You know, this is actually challenging my conceptions also to some extent that, you know, I used to feel that one of the strengths of our philosophy is that it is quite rational. And like you said, it answers questions which other traditions don't answer. Yes. But at the same time, in one sense, tarko pratishtha shuta yovibhinna, that rationality mm -hmm. itself is inconclusive. Yes. So, yes. It's like we want to have a drink, we need a container. The container is the philosophy, but the container is not the thing we drink. It just contains the thing we drink. It makes it so that it, we can access it. You know, I will, next time I get an opportunity, I'll try to speak some Krishna pastime to a Western audience and see how it goes. Yeah. I've never done that till now. I love it. <laughs> it's, and they don't expect it also. They're also expecting you to say some mindfulness stuff or like, you know, definitely this guy's not going to talk about God because he knows we, you know, he should be scared to do that. So then we bring these pastimes. They're just blown away how sweet they are. I, uh, another time um, I was at this yoga. Just one uh, minute before you move. Sure. So do you use sure. the word God or what do you use the word for Krishna? Yeah. So I, Supreme Krishna, the Supreme Personality, I try actually to stay away from the word God yeah. until, unless uh, the, I'll bring up the word God only first acknowledging that it's a pejorative term. Like this is a bad term that I know I'm not supposed to say, but I'm going to say it anyway mm -hmm. to challenge you. I bring it up in that way. Like I know you don't like this word, but I, my, my presence here is to indicate to you that maybe you should re-examine your relationship with this word because this God is a position, but Krishna is a person. And I'm going to talk to you about the person Krishna. And from there, you'll be able to better appreciate how he administrates the position of God. That's my, that's my mood in, in relating with them. So that to, just to this point, um, there is a yoga group. There is a yoga group up North here in Michigan. And, um, Self-Realization Fellowship, the Paramahamsa Yogananda, who wrote the autobiography of a yogi. They, they have a group up north, uh, kind of a New Vrindavan property, 800 acres. And we go up there and, and do programs with them from time to time. And we have a nice relationship. So they had one Swami come. And one of, their, uh, one of the young guys who organizes up there, he wanted me to come up and have like a debate with the Swami. He wanted to see like He's aware of the, the tension between the bhakti tradition and their tradition. And so he wanted us to have a, a face-off. 
So I, th I thought, okay, why not? Let's see. And the, this person was very, the, the Swami that they brought, very classic kind of Mayavadi philosophical jnani, uh, you know, neti neti, not this, not that. So he was preaching all this heavy, you're not your body kind of stuff and, and you have to renounce and the, you know, the senses are a network of illusion. <laughs> he was preaching all that stuff. So I got to talk about the sweet pastimes of, I had nothing else to say, but the sweet pastimes of Krishna. <laughs> so I started talking, I, I told the pastime of um, Krishna taking the banana peel from, uh, from um, Vid Vidurani and how, how God accepts our mood, not the, the what, what, what's offered, but why it's offered. I spoke about um, Lord Chaitanya allowing the woman to stand on his back to see Lord Jagannath at the Puri temple. Um, uh, several other pastimes I shared and if, at the end everyone was like wow David that was great we loved you talk so much their own guy was there <laughs> but they appreciated what I'd shared more because I was sharing the pastimes of the Lord and his devotees and the dry philosophy stuff although he didn't say anything objectionable he didn't say a thing about Brahman and you know everything being one and there is no God there is no Krishna he didn't say any of that stuff he spoke our philosophy from the point of sense control and the, the soul being separate from the body, but they didn't have much taste for that as compared to the Leela that I was sharing from our, our Shastra. Beautiful. And uh, so are there some aspects of Krishna Leela that you feel would be objectionable and we had better uh, maybe hesitate in talking about those aspects? Well, let me, I'll share a, here's a fun like thought experiment that I give to people to kind of dovetail their rational um, minds. I often challenge them and say, if you, if you examine the entirety of the Krishna Bhakti tradition and culture, if you examine this entire history, it, its very existence refutes the idea for which you think it exists. The, the detail of, the, of our history and tradition is so complex, it's so far out, to use a, an antiquated term, it's so detailed that it self undoes the usual idea for which religious stories and histories are there, which is to impart moral value and create some, time, some kind of social uh, theological union right? That there's some morals in society we want to impart to some people. So let's make up some stories and fables, which will help the people appreciate those story, those morals and principles that we want to, them to live by. The very complexity of Krishna Leela itself is a refutation of that idea. Why would you create such a complex history with so many characters and so many seemingly contradictory pastimes and exchanges? Why would you make this person God if that's all you wanted God to do? was create a moral philosophy by which people can live in this material world. The only explanation for the complexity of Krishna Leela is that it is in fact what's actually happening in the spiritual world. That's the only reason a, a, a thinking leader would ever want this to actually be brought into their society. Otherwise, it is dangerous and subversive literature. It is running against natural moral principles that this, you know, the Supreme Person is running around with many women and killing many people, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are abhorrent if and unless what we're saying about it is actually true, which is that it's a transcendental exchange of love between God and his most intimate devotees. That's a beautiful thought that in some ways, we could say the broad Vedic tradition serves the sociological or psychological need for religion and God. Yes. But the Krishna Bhakti tradition itself doesn't serve that need. In no. fact, the Krishna worship Bhakti tradition, you could say, subverts that. It undermines it. If you just take it on the surface, it would undermine it totally. Yeah. That's fascinating. And so again, answering that objection by bringing it out ourselves, don't think that's what this is for because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> that's not what this is for and that's not what we're about. Living your life in, a, in a, a naturally, in a moral way will bring you to the place of purity that you need to actually access these pastimes. That's what we're about. 
living your life in a natural way means means moral that kind of thing natural in a wholesome yeah. For, yeah living your life in a wholesome way according to hu- human morality will bring you to a place of being able to recognize the transcendental value of these pastimes that's what our tradition says so if you're still you know indulging in the senses writ large and you're self engaged in illicit sex and intoxication you're not going to be able to appreciate what krishna is doing here well you may appreciate because just to put it that way i think prabhupada says in krishna book that the krishna and gopi pastimes are the original and pure sex psychology yeah absolutely and, right and in that sense that was also nirutta tarshai rupagiya manad bhava ushada chotra manobiramat that this is like the medicine for those who are deceased and this is like the tonic or the stimulant for those who are already healthy mm. so we could say that it can attract everyone but the purpose of this is not to create morality yes so yes i sometimes talk about three levels there is the immoral the moral and the transmoral mm. so krishna's pastimes i exist at the transmoral level yes and uh, they can attract the immoral also to the level of morality and then to a transmorality but that's yes. not their purpose yes so if somebody thinks that the purpose of religion is to foster morality then at appearance itself or right from the first point itself the krishna leela seems to defy that purpose defeat that purpose exactly undermine it and again going to nietzsche speaking to somebody and i i reference him only as somebody who westerners have a lot of affection for there's a lot of affinity for nietzsche Even and there's today? a lot it with yeah definitely no? i mean most of most of what could pass as philosophy in the modern world is coming back to nietzsche's ideas most oh. of what the modern world has to offer is coming back to nietzsche's ideas and he he wrote a book beyond good and evil hmm. his whole premise was to rise above these these two moralities good and bad and to get to some transcendent place because at 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 the point in humanity he saw where everything was that essay we talked about where he says god is dead that spoken by a, a madman who's coming to a marketplace so even 150 years ago nietzsche saw that the focus on consumerism was eroding the better part of humanity and taking away his sense of a transcendent purpose so to rise above good and bad on a on a mundane moral level was going to be essential to rediscover our relationship with a higher purpose higher power god however you would like to put it so again nietzsche beyond good and evil and he also happened to say i will only believe in a god who dances so yeah. we would we would have to hold him to that statement <laughs> if we had the opportunity <laughs> so when you are saying about nietzsche talking about going beyond good and evil so you are talking relating that with krishna being transmoral is that the correlation why is, why is god dancing because he has nothing to do because everything's already done perfectly om purnam so now all he has to do is enjoy himself with his devotees who understand also that everything's going on perfectly and in that sense of safety and satisfaction they can express their hearts without any reservation yeah now i'm thinking of still going back to your earlier point of how krishna undermines the conventional conception of religion or krishna krishna bhakti yes so now we could say that like the gita verses four categories of people come to krishna the distressed mm-hmm. the financially needy the inquisitive and the knowledge seekers so are and these conventional motives for people to come to god so these four we could say are universal motives and now of course one answer could be that they are coming to god not specifically to the krishna conception of god yes yes and then that is 716 in the gita then two three verses later krishna then actually talks about himself more clearly that bahunam mm. janmanam ante gyanavan mam prapadyate mm. that after many lifetimes they actually become full with knowledge and they surrender to me knowing me to be everything yes so we could say 716 that is they are approaching a conventional conception of god or god as conventionally conceived and yes. by 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 becoming devoted 
that is that is still krishna but they are so we could say krishna is god you know i sometimes differentiate between the concept of god and the conception of god that you know all theistic religions accept the concept of god okay and in terms of fundamental attributes say like we could say omniscience omnipresence omnipotence those are more or less something which are, which are universal attributes of god or mm. you could a generator organizer destroyer mm. in the basic concept of god there may not be much disagreement between the various traditions right okay but beyond the concept there is a conception of god mm. so that might be something similar to what you said earlier the position and the person mm. yes the, so, the subjective relationship that the worshipers have with him yeah so 716 talks about people approaching the concept of god that you know mm. they are approaching okay god will give me relief from my problems and stuff like that but then yes. by staying connected with him then they come to appreciate the krishna conception of god mm. and that is when they surrender themselves because that is when krishna talks about prapadyante earlier mm. he is talking about bhajante bhajante is worship mm. they can we can go and pray do some rituals but it's it's more preliminary whereas this is an offering of one's entire being ha huh. hmm so even in the so even in the devotional journey people could come from a normal conventional conception of god to a more transcendental or a more transcendental conception of god absolutely yes and seeing where people are at this is another challenge that we have in our our own krishna conscious community we we have this tendency to download the entirety of the philosophy onto a person in one sitting and that's it's so overwhelming and it, it leaves them with more questions than answers rather the, our process of of preaching to ourselves is shravanam kirtanam and in also reaching out to others it should be shravanam first we should sit and hear from that person understanding they already have some relationship with krishna again it's not a matter of belief we we can be both simultaneously the most liberal and conservative people because conservatively we axiomatically accept everyone has a relationship with krishna and we liberally recognize everyone means everyone so no matter what condition of life someone is in they have some connection to krishna already it's my duty as a as a preacher to find out where that connection is where is that little seed sprouting and water that take care of that tend to it not just dump a whole pile of you know it might be the most fertile soil it might be very good compost but if i dump a giant pile of it on top of that little creeper then i'm killing it so to hear first and then do some kirtanam then speak to the particular situation concern interest they already have related to krishna that's powerful sharing of krishna consciousness rather than just a kind of objective um self righteous preaching speech you know dogmatic didactic kind of approach that many people take yeah that's beautiful so they all i used to talk about the point that to find out what is their current interest and see what is the like this is the circle of their current interest this is the circle of bhakti and mm. find where the two intersect yes like a venn diagram yeah, yeah totally diagram. But i think the way you are putting it is more devotionally apt also and it's not just a matter of their interest it is mm. they already have a relationship with krishna mm. and in some ways we could say that whatever is our deepest experience is our experience of krishna even Haribo. if you don't know it is some Haribo. sorry i i love that statement prabhu i'm yeah. just i'm saying hari bol to that i'm affirming it yeah. so i'm going to love music the music may not have anything explicitly devotional about it mm. but what is it about the music that is attracting them it yes. is a spark of krishna manifesting through that music to them hari bol the <laughs> <laughs> person in this car needs to hear this statement here i i this i call that the sankirtan principle right because what is what is sankirtan actually sankirtan is not spouting off things you heard prabhupad say in bhagavatam verses and berating people with bhagavad gita just for the name of saying that you did that so that when they walk away you can call them demons and feel justified sankirtan means that you're sharing your experience of krishna with that person 
your actual relationship with Krishna, you're inviting them into that same room with Krishna to be with him in that same way. That's real Sankirtan. So to what you're saying, social justice people, musicians, artists, businessmen, they're all having some experience of Krishna. They're convicted in whatever they believe to be the most important thing to speak to. And in that sharing and speaking, they're actually talking about Krishna. They're doing Sankirtan. So if we honor their Sankirtan, they will honor our Sankirtan. But if we dismiss them, if we say that you're in Maya, you're an illusion, every, your whole life has been a useless waste of time, then <laughs> what's the impetus for them to listen to what we have to say about Krishna if we're not willing to listen to what they have to say about Krishna? So Prabhupada says in the chapter 12, text 11, purport, uh, that, that famous section, if you can't do this for me, Krishna says, then do that for me. If you can't do that, yeah. then this, that stepwise description. Prabhupada says, in that respect, social service, community service, national service, sacrifice for one's country, etc., may be accepted so that someday one may come to the stage of pure devotional service to the Supreme Lord. If one decides to sacrifice for the Supreme Cause, even if they do not know that the Supreme Cause is Krishna, they will gradually come to understand that Krishna is the Supreme Cause by the sacrificial method. So we, we've got a website name, uh, The Servant Particle. And this is what we're really interested in these days. If, if people, you know, the question of do you believe in God or not, I've found to be a, not a very fruitful way to, do, to start a discussion around Krishna consciousness. Because many people believe in God and have very knucklehead ideas about what it means to have a relationship with God and what is expected of one who believes in God. What we're really looking for is people who are interested in bhakti, in service. If they have faith in the idea that my life is to serve, then those are the people that, that we can offer something to and can recognize the value of our community. But if they have a, a belief in God, but they just think God is there to give them their daily bread and provide for them a happy, safe, you know, comfortable existence in this material energy, I'd much rather talk to an atheist who's out there trying to save the world through, you know, self-sacrifice and service than a Christian who thinks God's going to make me rich. It's beautiful. A lot of points over there. First point <laughs> is, you know, we see social justice. Sometimes the word social justice warriors is used in a pejorative sense. But yes. people who do that, they have a zeal. And whether we agree or not with their specific cause, so we can't deny the seriousness which we they which they pursue that cause. Yes, they are experiencing Krishna over there. So you use the word the servant particle, is it? Yes, the servant it's part the God particle the <laughs> in, in reference to science. So we're interested in the servant particle. That's what the, the soul is. The servant particle. We're trying to find that in the heart of everyone. So it seems the word servant doesn't have that much of a negative connotation nowadays. Does it? No, it's no, it, it's certainly much more. Yeah, it's it's valu It's seen as valuable now. Maybe that's a result of our Krishna consciousness movement. As one of those subtle effects is that now in society in general, there is a recognition that my life should be about contributing to others. The challenge is that many people find a hard time navigating between that contribution and the need of just making it in the world. It takes so much effort just to have a stable existence for yourself what to speak of being able to do something for other people. So it's, it's very you know, confusing and bewildering for many people and their lives may look like very shallow expressions of this value. If you speak with them though, they do recognize the value of living for others, the value of service and being a servant minded as far as possible. Beautiful. I know the word contribution is very attractive. People want to contribute. Absolutely. Or even businesses talk about giving it back to society. Absolutely. And I, I saw one somewhere on a uh, news website, that, like an interview of a newspaper of an author, an intellectual, and there was people offering appreciation. And one mm -hmm. review was that he has the heart of a servant. <laughs> there we go. I found that very striking. That, there we go. that was considered like a eulogy almost. Huh. Um, it's funny, Kurt Cobain, who's one of the most famous rock and roll people, of the last 30 years he he was in a band called nirvana which maybe you've even heard of yeah they came out with an autobiography of him recently 
serving the servant. That's the name of his autobiography. <laughs> what does that mean? So I don't, I, I haven't read it yet, but it just, I saw it the other day online, serving That's the servant. That, that was Paul Krishna Maharaj's auto, you know, autobiography and his relationship with Prabhupada. And there's now some autobiography there about Kurt Cobain uh, called Serving the Servant. So that, that idea of being a servant is lauded now. It is seen as a valuable idea, something to strive for. What people are worried about in general is, again, I need to look after me also, and this world is not an easy place. And, and so there's this kind of, yeah, the two are, are seen in conflict. And that's, again, where Krishna consciousness has so much to offer. Because in Varnashram culture, the whole consideration is around what is my service? What is my sense of responsibility to others? If I'm considering others' responsibility, I will naturally be cared for and protected. And Yudhisthira is the prime extreme example of that, that he always considered others' welfare, and in that way he was always ultimately cared for. This was beautiful. You know, as contrast with belief, if you focus on contribution, then in one sense, we can actually dodge the whole question of belief. Absolutely. Because most people, <laughs> they want their life to have some meaning, some purpose. And as you rightly said, while it is a struggle to just uh, maintain your position in the world, but that doesn't really bring meaning and purpose to people's lives. You know, most people don't have careers. They have jobs. Yes. <laughs> Just do something to earn a living and have some close in society. That's not that they're driven toward that. Totally. So, so if we can offer them a, a framework where they can make a meaningful contribution. Yes. Then, then, the, then the rational theological aspect of the framework is not as important as the sense of personal meaning that it brings for them. Yes. And connection relationship that's what they're hankering for that they can't get from amazon or netflix or video games or pornography or their their stock trading whatever the other things they are doing they can't get that connection like they can get it in the bhakti sangha beautiful and uh, at the same point it goes back to your earlier point which said that you know people don't need to make sense so much of the world outside as they want to make sense of the world inside so Absolutely. it is probably a sense of meaning, a sense of connection that can calm the inner storm. Otherwise, yes. the mind can just go wild. Yes. And to maintain that, it's been shown that people are ready to believe anything. Right? This is culture based on this. That by providing people this, what they need, which is that sense of belonging and that sense of common purpose, unity, and, and personal inner development, if you provide that, people are willing to literally do truly crazy, self-destructive things. So we're lucky in that in Krishna consciousness, we have a way to provide that. And we also have something wholesome for them to do with their external life. It will be good for them and it will be good for others, unlike other cults, which provide those things, but then do so only to subvert and, and exploit that surrender that the person is offering. Yeah. Now this also makes sense of why people can join in irrational or even extremist groups. But they exactly. just want a sense of connection and meaning and purpose. There's no philosophy. <laughs> There's no higher purpose. There's no parampara. There's no saints. There's just a feeling of connection and purpose. And in that, people are satisfied for the most part. Most people are satisfied because most people are very simple hearted, you know, uh, shallow people and we can't fault them for that it's our responsibility to protect them and provide for them also that's so so in some ways you know we our tradition is a focusing a lot on taking people from goodness to pure goodness so Parikshit mm. Maharaj, arjuna was already in goodness and he was confused and the surrender he rises to good rises to pure goodness Parikshit Maharaj is also like that he lived a life of goodness Mm. So in raising people from goodness to pure goodness, mm. sometimes goodness is minimized and trivialized, even criticized. Mm. Sometimes we may criticize various isms, we may criticize humanitarian work. Mm. Mm. 
but you know that is it is ba- it, okay as compared to pure love for god that is that is uh, well let us not it should it shouldn't distract people from pure love of god yes but for people whom for whom love of god is not even in the in the horizon that's right <laughs> so then these these kind of humanitarian causes like you read prabhupad's 1211 purport these are what bring some kind of meaning to their lives yes and sometimes when we criticize them and and then we just alienate a lot of people exactly because exactly. people will not feel a Especially sense of pity krishna right? criticizing that krishna has come to them in that form that is their religion that is their deity that is the degree to which they've understood the the tattva they have a little knowledge that life is about service life is about contributing to others welfare who can argue with that in principle via the bhakti philosophy that's our philosophy they just understand a, a, a limited expression of it so we're the actual atheists coming in and and taking that experience of krishna away from them it's it's very abusive and violent actually i'm you know personally sick of it in our communities especially in the west it just totally disenfranchises us and makes us look like very insensitive you know potentially cultish people see when you use the word disenfranchise are you saying it in the sense that it alienates us from them or what do you mean by disenfranchise in this context the so disenfranchise there has some like there's some investment a franchise is something you invest in so when okay now my understanding of the word disenfranchise was that say somebody is a part of a voting ban of a they have the rights to vote and then their disenfranchise means they can no longer participate they can't vote that's my yeah. understanding of that's that that's also true yeah that's also but using in some other sense in the sense that we we have we we take away their um you you use in the context of right to vote so when we say that all their life's effort and and the as you said earlier the supreme realization of their existence so far to serve this particular cause and then we come in and say that cause is meaningless now we've disenfranchised them now we've taken away their power and their sense of purpose and and that's cruel that's um you know it's it's violence of the worst kind yeah i have seen places where people can do something or people where whichever projects especially western outreach projects where people have the opportunity to do something that's like the highlight yes even when we went to rindavan after going to rindavan when we were leaving with this group of western people mm. we asked them what was the best part for you and a large number of people said that when we went to that uh school for orphans and <laughs> served food to them mm. now initially when i heard that i was disappointed you know i thought that's just a humanitarian humanitarian activity and there is so much transcendental experience of krishna but you know from their perspective krishna might be way too high for them to experience and this is one step higher for them yes so rather than dismissing that as mundane we have to see that is the way in which they are experiencing krishna absolutely mm. the degree to which we see that is the degree to which they will be able to see that but to the degree that we don't see that how can we expect them to see Ch- you know chakshudana diloye that the the spiritual master which we're all being asked to become is giving that vision but if we don't have the vision ourselves how are they going to get the vision so we could say that if we don't see the potential for krishna consciousness in others that indicates the lack of krishna consciousness in us so absolutely everybody, everybody has some potential just need to discover that some experience also never never mind potential they have an experience of krishna already that's the ontological premise of our philosophy they cannot help but have some experience of krishna already so what is that experience of krishna they have faith in and how can i augment that there's a um vishnu jan maharaj the, there's a, a website which shares glorifications of him and i was reading through some of those and there was one person who was a friend of the devotees and he was just you know he'd hang out take prasad but wasn't serious at all and vishnu jan maharaj needed to travel somewhere in california maybe like la to san francisco or something i don't remember the geographic details but it was like a 3 hour drive and this person happened to have a truck which was a rare commodity back then you know a vehicle amongst the hippies 
So he offered to drive Maharaj, but he wasn't thinking to be very pretentious or anything. You know, he was just going to be himself on the drive. So he was cranking his rock music the whole time and listening to his favorite songs along the drive, just as he would any other time. And Vishnu John Maharaj sang his heart out with this man for three hours, these Karmi songs, rock and roll, whatever. After that drive, three hours, this person decided, I want to be a, a Hare Krishna also because he so much appreciated Vishnu John Maharaj uh, connecting with him on that level. Because for him, those rock songs, they were his bhajans. They were his heartfelt expressions. They were the songs that spoke to his, his highest realizations, mostly just around frustration and mundane love and politics, whatever. But for him, that was the absolute truth at that point. So then Vishnu John Maharaj relating on that level allowed him to recognize the level Vishnu John Maharaj was actually on and see that it is something better, something more to have than what I have just with this stuff. And he became a devotee and there he was two decades later glorifying Maharaj because of it. That's amazing. So normally we would say that this is something so mundane. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I remember Mata, I'm going to fall down if I hear this stuff. <laughs> I remember the first time I encountered something like this was Giriraj Maharaj had written a book on uh, on death and dying. I think he wrote several books. Mm. So in this book, mm. he talks about how he reconnected with his mother. And then how eventually during her last days, he was there and he helped her. That comes up. But then he said that uh, that initially he would get his mother to come to his house and they would watch some Prabhupada movie or some other movie like that. And he said that my mother would dutifully, would just out of deference to me, watch the movie. But after that, there was nothing to talk about. Uh. <laughs> so then, he said, then we decided to take some wholesome Western movies, which talk about mm. some morals. And mm. we would watch them together. And then mm. we would discuss something based on that. So, so then I wrote to Maharaj, Maharaj asked me to like review or edit his book. So then I wrote to Maharaj, Maharaj, you know, this might uh, raise some eyebrows. That is the why the sannyasi watching a mundane movie. Uh, so Maharaj, so humble. Maharaj said, actually, you know, for such uh, things, I consult with Rutudvaj Maharaj, who is my guide. So let me talk with him. And then Maharaj said that, you know, the point here is very clear. This is what I did to develop my relationship with my mother. And uh, I feel that that is the lesson that devotees should take from there. So that's, it's fine. I, I'm going to keep it there. Mm. So I appreciated that point that sometimes, uh, you know, we need to walk out of our Krishna circle to help people come closer. We can't just stay in the Krishna circle yeah. and keep pulling people inside. So, you jump. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, you jump across the, the you gap. You jump across, yeah. You jump. <laughs> That's true. So, I have recognized that in the last few years, I also connected more with my family and my friends and my pre-devotional friends and relatives. And it mm. actually opens them to Krishna much more when they see that we, are, we can connect with them at a human level before we demand that they connect with us at a spiritual level. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, true. So, Prabhu, I feel that, uh, you know, we talked about more like how to share the Krishna conception of God. Not so yeah. much challenges and charm, but mm. I think it's all included. So, should I summarize or you have something concluding, some concluding points to make? Sure, yeah. Well, I think the challenges, I, at least personally, I, I just, I felt the challenges came out through the the positive approaches, right? The challenges are actually mostly our own. <laughs> That's yeah. what I wanted to point out. That if sure. our own society focused on what we're doing uh, ineffectively, if our community looked at that, then the outside world would naturally respond much better rather than again pointing out, you know, what's wrong with them and their conception. Uh, it's, the, the problem is with the so-called preachers, as Srila Prabhupada put it once, um, with tears in his eyes, choked voice. The problem is with the so-called preachers. Prabhupada said this with choked eyes. 
Yeah, with with a choked voice, you can hear it. He's crying. The problems with the so-called preachers. He was speaking in the context of his God brothers, but we should take it for ourselves also that this Krishna consciousness movement is for everyone. And if people aren't attracted, that's my problem first. It's not their problem first. It's it's my problem first, and then we can look at what they're doing. But first, we have to look at what I'm doing or not doing. That's beautiful. So maybe I'll just try to summarize. We covered a lot Wait, of territory. I'm always so good at this. I'm, it fascinates me, your memory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just uh, live in fear that someday I'll try to summarize and I'll get nothing. cha. <laughs> <laughs> so when that day comes, it's all sufficient as mercy. Don't worry. Yeah, that's true. But basically, so we discussed about how how the Krishna conscious Krishna conception of God challenges and charms the contemporary mm. mind. So, so you shared your experience, and I shared mine, and we discussed other experiences also. That it is not so much the specific Krishna conception of God as uh, the bluish black coward boy that is a major factor either for or against. It is more mm. the what comes around it, the the experience of Krishna, which mm which could be through the rational answers to life's questions, which could be through the loving association of devotees, which could be through the experience of Parinam. So, mm. so you mentioned that your experience of Krishna is through the Bhagavatam and the Harinam. I said it's mine is through some prayer specifically, through the sound, but that was a common factor. And then, so our focus has to be on helping people experience Krishna. And the rational aspect needs to be stressed enough so that people become open to experiencing Krishna. But if we focus too much on the rationality, then that can alienate people. Because we want to see what is it that people need. So they don't need God so much to make sense of the rational order present in the outer world. No. At least not today. So that might have been a need a few hundred years ago. Now they want to make sense of their inner world. And that comes more by the experience of Krishna rather than by the explanation. And I like your point that purity means the alignment between experience and ex- explanation. Mm. And then I discussed about how for most people who come to Krishna, it is the, the Krishna conception comes Significantly later, and Prabhupada himself focused more on giving the experience of Krishna. And for that, we understand what is, we try to understand what is their deepest experience mm. and appreciate that deepest experience and then bring it closer to Krishna and help yes. to connect with Krishna. So then uh, you also talked about two, three things. Mm, quite, I found radical that, say, in my experience of trying to t- talk about Krishna with Western people, I was more apprehensive than they were skeptical. <laughs> and, and in your cases, you talked about, so if we give a basically a universal frame for contextualizing even far out pastimes, like say present the miraculous emergence of a deity from stone in the context of the power of prayer, mm. then it is not only intelligible, but it can also be a captivating. Yes. And then we we give people something that is instinctively at the contribution of our tradition rather than giving mindfulness, which is fine to the extent that it creates a bridge. But so Krishna's pastimes are, if told properly, and we discuss that we might have to discuss how to de-jargonize those pastimes. But if we do that, then we can, just through those pastimes, which are not there in other religious traditions, other, other religious traditions, idea of God. So they can be our strength in helping people experience Krishna. And mm. so Christians, they don't have much philosophy, but and what they give is, say, the experience of warmth and stuff like that, personal warmth. So what people want is a sense of pers- a connection, contribution, and how the word servant, servant particle, or servant leader, or heart of a servant, all these are quite acceptable or appealing also, laudable kind of, attribute so if rather than rather than demeaning 
pe- what people are passionate about what people are experiencing you know if we see that is there that is where they are krishna conscious now maybe indirectly but that is where they are krishna conscious and then we yes. try to elevate them from there to krishna so the uh, people uh, want that their life should have some bigger meaning and mm. if we can show how krishna consciousness can help them develop that uh, gain the bigger meaning for their life then the belief and disbelief won't matter at all because so many people get involved with so many activist causes where the rational it doesn't seem very rational but people do it because just they want that sense of purpose and meaning and connection and then we also discussed about how the one more point you mentioned is that people the conventional relig- reasons why people may come to god or people may come to religion in some ways bhakti the tradition undermines that so if religion is for establishing morality bhakti talks about a god who seems to who seems to transcend morality or who seems to transcend <laughs> yeah <Perhaps. laughs> so then uh, there is the concept of god in the conception of god in some it says all religions have a fairly common concept concept of god but we have a very distinct conception of god and we can attract people from wherever they are whatever their concept of god might be right now from that concept the specific specific distinctive conception of krishna that we have and you talk about how the problem the challenges in outreach are not so much with the krishna conception as our presentation as prabhupada said the so called preachers they are the problem and if we can just this brings me to the point that prabhupada was asked how we shared krishna, how he was able to attra- spread krishna consciousness movement all over the world and prabhupada said krishna is all attractive i just presented him as he is and he attracted everyone uh-huh. so maybe any, anything you like to conclude with no prabhu that was a miraculous summary as usual <laughs> and, um, so much love your association you bring out the best in me you thank you so prabhu serving in such a relation for thought i love to have a discussion sometime again in future of some related topic maybe we we'll talk about deorganizing our philosophy broadly our past times we could discuss that that would sometime. be fun that would be fun i always love having come any any excuse to have your association is good for me thank you prabhu hari krishna i hope go ranga hari krishna yeah.